The All Things XR Podcast. Where you can get the best AR VR analyzers from the biggest names in the field. Hi everyone, welcome to the All Things XR Podcast, I'm Mojtaba. In today's episode, we have a conversation with Jeff Powers, co-founder of Occipital and founder of Arcturus Industries. Hi Jeff. Hi, how are you? Thanks very much Jeff, welcome to the All Things XR Podcast. Can you tell us more about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, as you said, I am a founder in the AR VR space. I founded Occipital, we built things such as Red Laser, which is a barcode scanning app. 360 panorama enabled people to capture spherical panoramas on their phone for the first time. We built a 3D depth camera called Structure Sensor. Uh, and more recently, I've founded a company called Arturis Industries, and we are working on perception, 3D vision for the next gen of AR and VR devices. Um, and we're partnered with the folks at Valve, which is very fun. So that's kind of what I've been up to. Before that, I was uh, uh, I really came straight out of school to found companies. I really only had a few internships, never really worked anywhere for a long time. I was um, working on a PhD at the University of Michigan in AI, and I saw the amazing advancements that were happening in the computer vision field. I saw a huge gap between what was possible and what was being implemented and decided to drop my PhD and start a company. And that's kind of my history. Mm -hmm. Great. So what was the initial idea behind uh, Occipital and how you co-founded it? So I co-founded Occipital with Vikas Reddy. Um, and I worked with some others before that on related ideas. But really the idea was, interestingly, not a specific idea. It was more like the observation that computer vision was going to change the world and that there were very few companies that had actually started working on applications of computer vision. And we also had the emergence of mobile cameras for the first time. So you had this amazing technology to process and understand the world. You had devices that people were starting to carry with them. And it was just a question of what applications were gonna be first. Uh, we were always passionate about augmented reality since Really back in 2008, we did our first AR demos, but mm -hmm. it was very hard to get anyone to actually yeah. fund AR back then. Um, we ended up going after a simpler application. The first, the first real application that we built at Occipital was, um, and this was when we were Occipital LLC, before we raised any money, uh, we built a, a barcode scanning app called Red Laser that ended up being acquired by eBay. But, you know, I'll tell you a story, which is, there's even a product we built before that that we barely talk about because it was uh, we didn't work on it for very long and it it didn't end up like being the thing that that gave us a name. But the first product that we built was called ClearCam, and we actually were leveraging private APIs in the first iPhone, and it was a jailbroken app. You couldn't <laughs> do this kind of thing on the regular app store at the time and so we had actually reverse engineered or i had actually reverse engineered uh some of the apis in the very very early the first and second iphone in order to access i guess the, the second iphone to be able to access the camera and um and built this app that enabled you to do super resolution of the iphone and that app for us was was groundbreaking i think we had no money we had we had burned through all of our savings um, and we were just in the mode of, we need to make money somehow. And so we got in touch with, you know, the guys that were running the jailbroken app store, um, you know, Cydia and, yeah. and this guy, big boss. And, and we basically said, we, we built an app, um, to, to do high res photos in the iPhone. Can we launch it? You know, they let us launch it. And I think we ended up making something like 80 or a hundred thousand dollars in the span of several months and that just changed it just blew our minds yeah. like we went from 
we were these guys who had no money. We ran, we spent all of our savings on occipital pre-funding. Um, we thought we were going to have to throw in the towel. And then this little jailbroken app, you know, rocks our world and gave us the confidence to go on and do the next thing. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Jeff, I've always thought that starting a hardware startup is way harder than working on a software startup. And when you are in a very earlier stage market like AR and VR, it will be way harder. What is your idea about the challenges of hardware startups? Yeah, so we, you know, I started out being, uh, you know, we started out being purely software and but, but interestingly, my background was in electrical engineering. I had touched and understood hardware in school, even though I had spent most of my time working on software, mm -hmm. which is actually a really good analogy to what happened to me anyway in the startup world. And I, I think it's a story that I've heard from others um, that have done hardware startups as well, is you end up spending most of your time and energy still on the software. Uh -huh. uh, it's yes, you're building hardware, but you're you have to write so much software to build the hardware. So even if you think you're getting into hardware, you're still building a ton of software. Now, that doesn't mean that you know hardware is as, as easy as software. It's it is harder. It comes with a, a whole set of additional challenges, and one of the additional challenges that comes with hardware is that you're at the mercy of many many other suppliers. And these critical components, and if you don't have one of the components, you generally can't build your product. So you're always at the mercy of lots of vendors. I think in the structure sensor, we had over 300 components, which is crazy to think about. Um, but you know, if any one of those components is unavailable, you have to deal with that. So that's something just pretty foreign to software. I mean, in software world, uh, you know, an operating system will change and you'll have to update things, but it's far more, uh, you know, time consuming to, to manage hardware because you have all these parts that can go away. And, um, that's a different skill set too. You, you obviously need to have people that can design PCBs and that know how to, you know, produce things and maintain relationships with, you know, your manufacturer, assuming you're not actually building things physically yourself, which is uh, not usually the way people Usually you work with a contract manufacturer. So yeah, I've been, I've been all over the world building hardware. We worked with folks in Israel. We worked with the PrimeSense team before they were acquired with Apple. We yeah. worked with, uh, you know, uh, Foxconn and Foxlink and you name it, all the, the names of the companies that, um, that make things like the iPhone. We, we talked with those guys and um, J-Bill and, you know, there's just this whole world of, of hardware companies and, hardware producing companies and yeah, it's a whole new world. It's amazing. But once you, once you understand it at the end of the day, it's, it's still engineering. It's still, um, you know, just managing timelines and, and fundamentally it's in some ways not that different, although it does add complexity. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, Jeff, you did a lot of things in Occipital from your products in software like canvas to your um, sensors and cameras. Can you tell us more about the products you built in Occipital? Yeah, so we were just talking a little bit about hardware. So mm -hmm. the, the hardware products that we built were the structure sensor, which at this point has, you know, uh, impacted a lot of industries. Yeah. There's been hundreds of, of companies that have used it, especially in the, the healthcare industry and orthotics and prosthetics and body scanning. It's it's amazing to me what, what that product went on to do uh, and still does today. So yeah, we built a depth camera. For those who don't know, it's a, it's a 3D depth camera that you could attach to a mobile device. And in particular, we focused mostly on the iPad. So you could buy this sensor from us called Structure Sensor, um, and you still can today from Occipital. You can buy the Structure Sensor, and you can attach it to an iPad, and it gives the iPad 3D vision. Mm -hmm. um, but it gave the iPad 3D vision, you know, seven years before the iPad got its own 3D sensor, which eventually did exactly. happen. But you were able to launch and deploy applications seven years ahead. It really kind of teleport you into the future seven years, and 
even today, there are things you can do with a structure sensor that you can't do with the sensors on the iPad, for example. Uh, for example, if you want to scan a, some a human hand or a relatively small object, um, you can do that much more easily with the structure sensor than you can with the LiDAR sensor that's built into the latest iPad Pro. So we kind of gave people this capability seven years before. The way we did it was actually we were inspired by the Microsoft Connect. Uh -huh. And in fact, in fact, in a very literal way, we actually went to the company that had built the components in the Connect, which was this company, PrimeSense, that was yeah. eventually acquired by Apple. We actually went to them and said, hey, we want to build a mobile connect, essentially. And we managed to you know, convince them to actually let us do that. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is that Occipital and Microsoft were the really the only companies that I'm aware of that truly modified and built and shipped their own connect powered you know or prime sense powered sensor we uh -huh. we went down to you know the pcb we designed our own board uh we designed our own firmware we designed our own production line we heavily modified things that we inherited from prime sense so we that allowed us to continue to produce the structure sensor for six or seven years after uh prime sense was acquired by apple whereas a lot of other companies that had just bought these sensors from from prime sense didn't have that ability they just had to buy some stock and hope that um they could switch to something else so that was interesting we we really got deep with it but then after prime sense acquired uh uh well, sorry after prime sense was acquired we ended up having to build our own system from the ground up so so that gave me a lot of experience working with you know sourcing your own cameras and laser projectors and you know building your own depth system from the ground up we we ended up again working with another um, Israel-based team, uh, which was the um, uh, Innuitive has a chip to do depth processing. But the, but for our second generation, we we did so much from the ground up. So, Structure Sensor was a huge effort. It was the in terms of revenue, it's the largest thing um, Occipital did, um, and it was by far the the thing that that took most of our attention. But um, we did a lot of other things. We, we also built a, an early mixed reality headset that was powered by the iPhone and the structure sensor, and it was called Bridge. And we attracted several thousand developers. And, um, and in a lot of ways, it was kind of like a Magic Leap device before Magic Leap. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, could, you could do a lot of the same things. You could map your surroundings. You could insert characters and, and you know, virtual entities. You could... Um, you know, you could detect surfaces and planes and you could, um, you know, you could mesh the whole room around you and, and it was fully immersive. It was, you know, similar to how some people have rumored that maybe Apple's working on a, you know, a pass through video device. Um, that's how, that's how bridge worked is, is we would actually map the world around you. We would then take the camera on the iPhone and we would project that into each of your eyes mm -hmm. and we would do it, you know, through a VR type display. And so everything was, um, you put this headset on and, and, and you saw the world through the headset. It wasn't, it wasn't actual see through cause we, we didn't have the, you know, the capability or, or desire to build a, a full see through AR headset. It was, it was a pass through headset, which, yeah. which was really interesting. And it enabled you to do some, some very cool things that you can't even, you still can't do and won't be able to do for a very long time with, with pass-through type devices. So we built Bridge and we eventually retired Bridge after a few years of upgrading it for new iPhones, but it it attracted some developers and, and Bridge was the beginning of the AR VR efforts at Occipital, which eventually morphed into what became my latest company, Arcturus Industries. But before we talk about that, you know, just to complete the picture on Occipital, um, you mentioned Canvas and Canvas is probably the thing that I'm the most proud of, and it's the thing that we we anticipated building in 2012. You know, maybe I mean, that was probably when we first talked about it when we were talking about the structure sensor, and we we had a plan that we were going to build this hardware, and then we were going to build software that enabled people to capture their 
their surroundings, their, their homes in particular, and modify them and redesign them and, you know, extract all sorts of useful information, like how many square feet are these rooms or how much paint do I need to redo this wall? Or what would it look like if I totally changed, if I knocked down this wall and I did something new? And so we have this idea for building the software um, and we really wanted the company to have revenue that wasn't principally hardware driven. We wanted to be kind of like delivering a service. And ultimately we, we finally broke ground on canvas, I think uh, 2015 in, in earnest and, and launched it in 2016. But it's for those who don't know, canvas is an app that allows you to uh, scan rooms in in residential spaces for the most part um you know it's not like matterport though matterport is intended for you to create a virtual tour and of course matterport has other aspirations but canvas from the beginning has been about home improvement projects so whether you are potentially a homeowner doing a do-it-yourself project or really the bigger target now is professionals that are helping people you know remodel uh, or potentially redesign a space, you can go in with with uh, with Canvas, which now works with the LiDAR sensor on the iPad. You can scan a room. And what's, what's the most magical about it is you can convert that room into a, you know, parametric, essentially, CAD file. So you can actually, you know, just click on a wall and it'll tell you exactly the dimensions of that wall. Or, you know, just drop something in or or hide a wall or you know, send this out to an architect. It's it's the format that that industry works in, as opposed to, you know, a triangle mesh with with fifty million triangles that professionals don't know how to work with. We can actually take a space and turn it into these editable, interactive formats, and and that's what Canvas does. And and I'm really excited to see where Occipital can take Canvas into the future because I think it I think it will change the way that. I think that kind of technology, whether it's Canvas or, or something else, is really going to change the way that all home improvement projects start in the future. That that's how they should start. And so that and, and so Canvas lives on today and, and grows and now, like I said, is powered by the sensors that are built into the iPhone and the iPad um, and doesn't even need a struct sensor anymore. So structure sensor got us started, but it, you know, the future is software for, for Occipital now. Yeah, yeah, great. So, um, Jeff, as you mentioned, last year, Apple introduced LiDARs into its devices and it affected many sensor and hardware startups, um, including uh, Occipital. In general, what is your idea about big companies um, disrupting startups in AR and VR? And what is the best strategy for AR and VR startups in this regard? It's a great question because it's... It's simultaneously not something you should worry about that much, mm-hmm. but also something that over a longer time scale you really you really do have to worry about. And it's it's interesting because you know for for startups in some sense like speed and timing is everything. And if you go after something that these big companies are going to go after, uh, you either you, you don't have too many choices. One choice is or too many, you know, possible outcomes. One outcome is you build it faster, better than them. And that leads to you either a getting acquired quickly, Mm -hmm. or B, um, uh, you know, actually trying to, to, to beat them. And that, that happened with, you know, things like if you think about YouTube in the beginning, like that's kind of what happened with YouTube, like YouTube was, was fighting Google, Google tried to YouTube with Google Video, Google failed, and then Google eventually had to acquire YouTube for a lot more money. Um, but that's kind of the the battle you're in if you're going to go after uh, something that big companies are going to go after. And and you know, so it's either you you go fast enough to get a you know you either get acquired, you you possibly beat them, but you're to beat them, you're going to have to probably go raise a bunch of money. You're going to have to really level up the stakes, um, and and actually try to beat them, which yeah, I think is a very stressful route to go. Yeah. Or, or third, you're just not going to, if you can't keep up, if you don't have the resources, um, you're going to sort of be in this long slog of being maybe just ahead of what the big companies are doing, but it kind of doesn't matter because they have so many more resources that once they actually put them on your, 
your thing, they'll eventually, it'll be this slow death where you don't go away right away and you might have a reasonably successful business for a few years, but eventually you won't be relevant because they'll be able to just spend uh, so much more money. And, and this is in particular, if we're talking about hardware, where, you know, something I probably should have said before is that the first generation hardware isn't that hard to build as a startup, uh-huh. but the second and third and fourth generation those get really complex and hard. And the reason is because you can no longer use off-the-shelf parts, right? If you look at uh, Oculus, uh, when Oculus was an independent startup, Oculus was able to basically go ask for scraps from the smartphone industry and plug those into a headset and create this mind-blowing experience that nobody had experienced before. And that was enough. But if you think back to, to what it was like to use a DK1 from Oculus, and you compare that to what we have now, it was it was terrible. But at the time, it was it was mind blowing. And you can get away with that in the first generation. But then when you get to the second and third generation, you have to be you have to have the leverage and the potentially the money to be able to go back to suppliers and say, give me a customized part that um, doesn't exist yet. Yeah. You know, just for me. And 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 that's you have to have incredible resources to be able to do that, generally speaking. And so you either have to go raise a whole bunch of money. And that's kind of why like Magic Leap raised a bunch of money and things like that is because you you need to have that leverage to be able to get these parts made. Um, and um, and so again, like that's another challenge for, for startups trying to go after areas that big companies are going to go after. And so I think, I but that doesn't mean you shouldn't necessarily go after those things because there are going to be areas of act, active acquisition interest and things like that. So it's a very complex problem and it's it's tricky you need to have some confidence that you can do it without a lot of money and that you can do it faster Um, if it's going to be something that requires a ton of money and unless you have founded some wildly successful thing before and you can go just snap your fingers and get 50 million or 100 million dollars like you need to go after something that doesn't cost as much money to build and where speed is an advantage um, and where you think you can maintain that advantage for a few years Otherwise, going squarely after something the big companies are going after is probably going to be extremely stressful, probably going to be disappointing in the end. So finding something that's a little bit of a niche, I think, can be can be a, a way to go um, for for new founders. Yeah, exactly. You know, hardware is hard for anyone. You look at Meta, for example, Magic Leap. Um, even um, Oculus and uh, Snap uh, Spectacles are burning money like crazy. Um, my yeah. friend Robert Scoble says that um, uh, Facebook uh, actually literally puts a thousand dollars in um, every uh, Oculus Quest box because it's not three hundred dollars. It's much more. Uh, it takes much more to make one of those, but um, uh, Facebook has the resources and can do that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's just, you can't compete with that, right? If you're if you're a startup and yes. And so that's why a lot of startups go to, for example, enterprise and things like that, where yeah. you can charge a lot more. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, Jeff, what is the current status of Occipital? So Occipital uh, continues. The company has focused more on Canvas than anything else Mm -hmm. and does continue to produce the structure sensor. Uh, There's improvements coming. Uh, I hear some exciting accuracy improvements and things like that are are coming for structure, but the company is really focusing most of its energy on Canvas. And um, we've, we've, you know, hired a new team. We've got, we've got a new CEO. I was the CEO for, uh, however many years, nine years. And, um, and now we have a new CEO, we have, uh, we have growing team and we have growing products with Canvas. So that's kind of the, the status of the company and company is really focused. Some of the older products we built, things like 360 Panorama have been shut down, which is, which is sad, uh-huh. um, but makes sense from a focus perspective. So yeah, Occipital, the summary is heavily focused on Canvas and hopefully going to you know, continue to grow and change the way that people, um, you know, start their home improvement projects and the way that professionals capture spaces for home improvement. 
Mm -hmm. Great. So, Jeff, before we get to your current company, Arcturus uh, Industries, what are the lessons you learned along the way in uh, co-founding uh, Occipital? And what would you do differently if you go back in time? Yeah, I would do uh, I would do many things differently. I would do some things the same. Mm -hmm. uh, one lesson that I learned was, um, you know, like I said before, building a second generation hardware product is very different than building a first generation, at least in my experience. And the second generation, when you go to replace a lot of off-the-shelf things with custom things, each of those things takes a lot longer than you might think. And so in my experience, um, you know, one thing I, I might have done back in the day is accelerated our transition to pure software and stayed on the roadmap of um, how do we how do we make this company uh, again a pure software company and just use our interim hardware the structure sensor generation one as the bridge to get to that future instead we 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 invested many you know man years into a second generation hardware product which in the end is is on the market and does allow people to continue using uh you know a product from occipital but as we know, the LiDAR sensors from the iPhone are here and it's not like they're going to get worse. They're going to get better. Exactly. Deep learning is here that enables us to do, you know, things even without these kind of sensors that, you know, and so, so there's somewhat of a lifespan of, of that hardware. And so one lesson was, you know, don't get yourself in over your head with, you know, second generation hardware, unless you're planning to go raise a crazy amount of money. We never raised that much money at Occipital especially compared to a lot of peers. Um, so another lesson is focus and making sure that you really focus on what's important. And one thing as a founder that I learned is that it's, I mean, I'd say I, I didn't learn this. It's pretty obvious, but the thing that is making the most money at the time is going to absorb most of your attention even if that isn't the most important thing necessarily to be working on. Uh -huh. And, uh, and that's a lesson, you know, I needed to be focusing on what was our future more than what was our present. And, you know, it's easy to get stuck in the trap of looking at what's, what's currently making money. Okay. It'll be a lot easier to make that thing. That's make money. That's making money two times as big as it is. than it will be to take this new idea that we think is going to be the future and make that a thousand times bigger than it is, right? It just seems so much easier to take the thing that's already bigger and two exit than to take the thing that's smaller and a thousand exit. But in, in hindsight, the things at Occipital that were, you know, Canvas in particular that was needed to thousand X uh, is, is really and was going to be the future of the company. But I focused so much of my energy on keeping and putting out fires on the thing that was making the most money uh, at the time. And that's, of course, a, a particular observation that was somewhat unique to my situation, because in other cases, it will make sense to focus on the thing that's making the most money. But that's where you have to use your intuition as a, as a founder or a CEO and, and think about what is really going to happen in the future. Do I know that this product is only a temporary product and in the future, we're going to have to be doing something else. If that's the case, you need to seriously figure out how you're going to be planning for that future because you cannot continue to rest on your laurels of a product that you know isn't going to be around for 10 years. And that, that can be very, very hard to do because, you know, everybody sees the, the dollars coming in and that's where everybody wants to focus. Even, even the board, even, you know, you know, a lot of people see the bigger numbers and, and think that's where you should focus, even if in fact it isn't. Mm -hmm. and, and having the courage to not do that, having the courage to say, no, we have to focus more on the future is one of the biggest challenges. It's going to be one of the biggest bets you're going to ask people to make. Um, and if you're right, then you're going to look, uh, well, well, probably nobody will remember that you said that. But if you're right, I think you're going to be more successful um, than if you don't. So focus and focusing on what is important for the future, um, not getting too distracted by what is um somewhat successful in in the interim and I, one of the phrases for this is you know being a victim of your own success having success in one area but having that not quite be the right area and that's that's the challenge make sure the thing you're succeeding in is the thing that's going to propel you into the future 
If it isn't, figure out ways to put your energy on what is important. Um, another lesson that I would bring up, uh, and feel free to interrupt me with questions, but another lesson that I no, would no, 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 go bring up yeah, is um, keeping in touch with larger companies who may be strategic partners or acquirers. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I regret not doing more of that. I, I did some of that. And part of the reason I didn't do a, a lot of that is because it can be, uh, it can be disappointing. And maybe you've experienced this, but when you talk with a lot of bigger companies, there's just so many people, they don't talk to each other. Um, you can just spend a lot of time going, going nowhere, um, talking to bigger companies. But at the same time, like I saw a lot of peers being acquired by, uh, for life changing, you know, with lo- like people getting life changing outcomes. Yeah. Um, in part because they were they were being in those in the right conversations with the right partners or acquirers, and I think it's important to make time to do that. Um, and one thing that maybe goes along with that is also not being afraid to talk about your your technology, not being afraid to talk about you know things that you're working on in public. I think it can be more beneficial to talk about what you're doing than to try to keep it all secret. Um, because again, you get on the radar of these people that could be strategic partners or acquirers. So it's a, it's a lesson that I, I think I've learned now. It's still easier said than done to talk about your stuff more in public because you actually have to do it. You have to write it well, you have to display it well. You can't just, can't just throw something out there, but, um, making sure to talk about that stuff. Don't be too afraid. Don't feel like you have to keep all your ideas secret. Your idea is very unlikely that it's unique. Yeah. Um, and so figuring out the right trade off between, you know, um, not giving away everything. You don't want to give away every idea you ever had. You don't want to, you don't want to telegraph every move that you're going to make, but also don't be afraid to talk about the area that you're in, what you're generally going after, because that's going to lead to some of those strategic discussions that are potentially for most startups, an exit to a larger company that hopefully has a shared vision is one of the best outcomes. It's, it's relatively rare that you go IPO. Um, and so, and so being in touch with those companies, not being afraid to keep those relationships is one of the things, a lesson that I would have, uh, I think I learned and, and something that I would, that I, I will, I will do more and would have done more, um, back then. Mm-hmm. Great. Thanks very much, Jeff. Those are uh, very valuable experiences. So now let's get to your current startup, um, Arcturus Industries. Can you tell us more about it? Absolutely. So Arcturus Industries is a company that is founded by myself and a number of others who I worked with at Occipital on basically what I would call the ARVR team. Uh-huh. Um, we had, uh, we had essentially built this, this computer vision AR VR team, and we were focused on things like positional tracking, controller tracking, uh, you know, scene understanding things like plane detection, line detection, um, you know, segmentation, but basically underneath every future AR VR device, you need to have this kind of a perception engine and the team that had built that at occipital um joined me to form arcturus industries and and that was part of occipital focusing on you know indoor capture and and uh home improvement projects we're really working on an ar vr engine wasn't really compatible with with that and so yeah so that's where the arcturus team came from and so really we're the ar vr or the xr end of uh, of what we were doing at Occipital. And so the, the team that worked on some of the things like the bridge headset I mentioned and our positional tracking, they, we all came over and, and formed Arcturus. And so Arcturus is building a platform independent state of the art perception layer for future AR and VR devices. And it's one of our key differentiators is really that we are platform independent. We're not uh, it's not like you can just use our stuff on Windows or you can just use it on Android or you can just use it with a Qualcomm chip. Like yeah. you can use it with any of these 
uh, systems. You can use it on embedded Linux. Uh, you can use it on Windows. It's, it's very flexible how, where it can run. It's also very flexible in what types of inputs it can take. Our, our engine can read from one camera, from, you know, multiple cameras up to generally up to four cameras, like Great. for example, what you have on the quest. Yeah. Um, and, and we can do a lot of the same things. We can, we can build a map around you. We can track your position. We can track controllers, um, all the things that you need for an XR device, but not platform locked at all. And so I hope that, you know, and we're partnered with Valve. We're working on some future, you know, great. VR plus computer vision with them. And I really hope that that our platform will somewhat level the playing field, so that uh, you 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 don't have such a daunting advantage, like someone like Oculus that really just kind of controls everything because it was and is incredibly expensive to build that kind of a system. And without that kind of a, a vision system, you couldn't have the Quest, right? Exactly. Um, and, but for a lot of these smaller companies that are trying to build AR and VR devices, they, you know, they don't have this kind of technology. You can't just get this open source. It's very hard to build and hard to make robust. And so hopefully we'll level the playing field so that others can enter and have compatible, you know, competitive, um, uh, AR, VR scene understanding. And that's kind of what Arcturus works on. Mm -hmm. Great, that's great. So, uh, Jeff, as someone who has been in AR and VR market for years, how do you see the future of AR and VR? And uh, are we going to live in an Oasis-like future soon, or it will take decades for AR and VR to become mainstream? <laughs> I think it's going to take decades. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I, I I shouldn't say I don't know about mainstream. I don't know about mainstream. It's going to take decades before any kind of Oasis thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think VR is quickly becoming potentially what we might call mainstream. Um, you know, we have PlayStation VR, new version of that coming. Uh, we have uh, we have the Quest, which as much as I'd like this, these things to be less platform locked, uh, you know, the Quest has been good for VR developers, actually yeah. giving VR developers a, a monetization path, which... Which is great because up until now, it's been like this labor of love where you just had to be passionate and you weren't really going to make any money. But now you can actually sell to a re relatively large audience through the Quest. So, exactly. So that's great to see. Um, and so that's going to continue to grow. It's not going to be, I don't think, at this high exponential that people want to see. For example, when we think back to the iPhone world um you know when the iphone just took over and, and then smartphones just took over I, I don't think that we're going to see the exponential curve quite that high um but looking at recent charts it, it is exponential it's just maybe a lower exponential curve so i think i think we're going to see a lot more vr i hope i hope that we see things like more comfortable vr in particular because i think that's a limiting factor the fact that when you put vr on you are totally closed off from the world and then, of course, when you put AR on, it well, one, it doesn't really exist in a, a consumer-friendly form. You get a short battery life. Uh, you get a narrow FOV. Exactly. Yeah, there are like limiters to, yeah. to AR. So AR has all these limiters. It's not comfortable. It's not you know, it's not the right form factor. VR is is very you're very closed off from the world. It's it's less social. You're detached from the people around you. So I hope we see new devices that start to address that. I I see a future where five to 10 years from now, um, almost every consumer home has a VR device, mm -hmm. at least in, in certain countries, and, and, and where you'll have these VR devices that are essentially just displays that are sitting, there's a few of them in the, in the home. Like there's, I'll have two or three sitting in my, my living room, and we can just pick these things up, we can put them on. If we put them on simultaneously, we're both in the same VR world, I'd actually, it's a small thing, but I'd actually like to see devices that are not as enclosed where, you know, even some of my peripheral vision can be retained, even though I have a display in front of me so that, you know, we put these things on, we're not as detached from our physical world. The form factors will become more and more like goggles. Yeah. So you'll be able to maybe like actually drink out of a cup, you know, not, not with a straw <laughs> yeah. while you're in VR. You, you just put these things on, you'll be, you'll be transported into the same space and you'll be able to then jump into different VR experiences. And I think we'll, we'll see some of these replacing um, a lot of different tasks that we do today. Like 
like you'll see people like credibly using this to watch uh, movies together and, and you won't have as much need for a large screen display. You'll, um, you'll, you'll see this as a way to, to visit your friends virtually. It'll just be very natural to do uh, a VR call in this way. So I think that's going to happen. I think that's going to be, um, I think that in five to 10 years, that's going to be something that most people have seen or used or, or, or own. Um, but the, the, the AR side of it, where we have these glasses that we wear all the time and they, they, they show us the world that I think is going to take a lot longer than people think. Mm -hmm. And that might be 20 years because I think there's just some crazy challenges with power consumption, display, weight, batteries. We just have so many challenges to solve that, uh, you know, to get these systems down to like a watt, like that's, I mean, um, well, you know, the, the processors take like five Watts, the display takes another five or 10 Watts, the, you know, the cameras take a half a watt or, or so like to get these things down to the place where, you know, you can just wear them all day long. It's, I don't know. I don't think we know how to solve that right now. And even when we do solve that, um, you know, is that even going to be enough for everybody? Because like, I don't even wear glasses. I wear contacts and would I wear AR glasses all the time? I don't know. I'd wear them some fraction of the time, but I think you're going to have issues there too. So I think this is going to take like 20 years. I think mm. I don't, is going to be like blazing with glasses next next year what i do think may happen though is ar devices that are are limited in their function they're not even maybe, maybe they don't even have displays um i think that we need to think a lot more about cameras that we can wear uh you know wearable devices that are different than the phones that we have today i think i think there are new categories of products that will bring AR to us progressively, even before we have these magic glasses that we can wear all day. That's great. So um, I think we can say now that every fan company is looking for a party in the future of AR and VR. Between current players, including Google, Apple, Snap, Microsoft, and others, who do you think has the best chance? Um, you know, um, I think, I think Apple has the best chance of near-term substantial adoption of something, but I don't know that Apple actually knows what the right uh, product is. And I wonder, like, post-Steve Jobs, do they really have the vision and the... I mean, really, you think about what they've done. They've, they've launched a whole bunch of iPhones. They've launched a whole <laughs> bunch of iPads. They've yeah. launched a whole bunch of Macs. They've just launched all the stuff that Steve Jobs, you know, started. They haven't really introduced a new category. This would be a new category for them. And they believe in it, but I, I don't know that they really have the right vision. But they do have the courage uh, when they do get behind something. They have the courage to, to push and, and do things, which is something that a lot, a lot of other companies don't. A lot of other companies will, uh, will just be natural followers. They will not introduce something new. They'll introduce a new feature, but they won't introduce like a whole new category. And so I think Apple's the most likely to be, to have the courage to introduce a new category and a new set of, of uh, you know, behavioral modifications, like people going about their day in a different way. Um, and that's what it's going to take is like really rethinking how do you use devices. If we if we just add another device where it's like you still need your phone and your glasses and your watch, like at some point there's going to be device fatigue. I don't want to. I don't even exactly. have an Apple Watch partly for that reason because I don't want to have to manage so many devices. Me and too. so, yeah, this is going to have to be. A, and there's a lot of people like that. And I think, and so you can't just say, no, get, get your Air AirPods and your glasses and your phone and your watch and your iPad and your Mac. And then you're good to go. It's like, there's, that's impossible. So we've got to figure out how to, how to actually transition people to this device and have it be less, not more. Um, Apple has the courage for that. I think, I think companies like Qualcomm are going to be big players because they, um, they have the chips that actually do this and they've had the courage to actually build some of the underlying technology. Um, whereas other chip makers have not uh, really invested at all in in having software that works tightly with hardware for AR VR, I think 
the other advantage that Apple has now is they're, they are building their own chips, and so they can get the power consumption down. And that is one of the most, the huge challenges for AR is optimizing everything to the point that you're not using that much power. And I see very few companies. And one reason I think AR and VR are going to, or AR is going to take 20 years is because outside of maybe Apple and, and maybe Qualcomm, I see basically no one that's really realizing how much of a system problem this is and isn't really having like software people talking to hardware people. Like usually they're so separated. And so you just don't have this cohesive system approach. Like we need like the Manhattan project for AR. We need like, uh -huh. you know, need people to be putting all their minds and resources together. And how do we solve this? Otherwise it's going to take 20 years. Um, and so, yeah, so those are a couple of the players that I, that, that I think are going to be huge. I think that, I think Microsoft is going to be, is going to be, um, a big player though, too, because they, um, uh, you know, at least they're going to be making money while other people are kind of goofing off and they're continuing with the HoloLens and there's so much improvement they could make to the HoloLens. It's, it's somewhat surprising they haven't iterated it faster, but in terms of being like this workhorse AR device that's actually being able to be used in professional contexts while we wait for things to shrink for the consumer use case, like Microsoft is doing an admirable job and I, and they, they have leadership that seems to have some vision there um, which, you know, I don't see, um, at places like Google right now. I mean, okay. Google has VR team. They did project Starline, which is pretty cool, but in AR VR, I don't see Google having much vision. Um, I don't, I don't see Amazon having much vision. Um, but I, th I see Microsoft having some vision. I see, I see Apple maybe having some vision, but Apple is a, is a conundrum. You, they don't talk about things that much. You don't know. You just know Tim Cook says AR is important, but that's, that's <laughs> yeah. all you really know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but again, they've had the courage to do big shift changes, and so I think they probably have the best chance of anybody. Um, but what's sad and funny is that if any of these other companies with massive amount of resources just decided to grow some courage, I think they could also be uh, huge, huge players. But just so many of them are, are followers, and they're just let's let's run twenty exploratory programs so that when somebody else moves, we're ready to move. That's that's what so many of them are doing. Even Apple is really doing that. So many of the projects you hear of are probably just Apple being ready in case someone else launches something. But I don't think they really feel figured it out yet either. So um, it's it's a weird time to be alive <laughs> and to be. Everybody knows this is the future. Nobody knows how. And yeah, that, that's the weird thing. That's exactly. the weird thing. Exactly. Uh, what do you think about Facebook and Snap? Uh, I think Snap is. Uh, you know, I probably should have mentioned Snap because they are continuing to stay, they continue to have an edge, uh, continuing to, you know, stand up against Instagram and others, uh, even despite being copied all the time. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, with spectacles, uh, a device that has a camera doesn't even have a display. Like, that's smart. I like that approach because a lot of the things you want to do in AR... Um, maybe we shouldn't even call them AR, but a lot of the future of computing is, is, is I think, new form factors like that. And so yeah. I think, you know, I regret, I actually was intro to Evan Spiegel like five or six years ago, and I, I dropped the ball on actually going to meet him because at the time I was like, what is, uh -huh. what is, like, what are these kids doing these days? And, <laughs> uh, and, 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 sure, and I had heard like, oh yeah, they're really working on computer vision. I think it was even more than five years ago. And, and I'm like, oh, sure, yeah, right. They're a computer vision company, whatever. <laughs> um, but then now that what I've seen them actually do, it's like it's it's pretty impressive. And um, and the way they're using computer vision practically today, the way that you know they're they're folding computer vision and AR into experiences that people are using, you know, billions of times per day. I assume at this point is is pretty inspiring. And so they're kind of like you don't think of them. In, a lot of people don't think of them as like an AR company, but like they probably have a great shot actually, mm -hmm. because not only do they have like um, of this practical approach of doing things that people are actually going to use now, like they just may morph into an AR company. We may not even notice it. They may not even, you know, say we are AR now, but, but all of a sudden you might realize they're shipping the, the world's largest, um, you know, 
uh, distribution of AR AR devices, it, even if even if they don't have displays, you know, it, for a few years. Of course, they now have their their device, their developer device with the display, but you know, it's it's probably a few years away from something a, a consumer will use. So so Snap is is very interesting from that perspective. There's also Niantic, who yeah, you know, we probably should skip mentioning them because they yeah, have yeah, exactly with Pokemon Go. They have like the largest revenue of any AR company, and I. I don't, I don't even know if we should, you know, in some ways I don't know if we should call them an AR company because like is, is Pokemon Go successful because of AR or because of Pokemon? <laughs> but, um, but, but they certainly have uh, the largest, you know, I think revenue of any kind of AR game and maybe any kind of AR period except outside of maybe Microsoft and, um, or if you want to count Snap. But, um, and they certainly have an, a window to, to become a big player there too and, and so I'm, I'm following them as well. But um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't have, uh, I can tell you, I, I don't think it's going to be Google. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to be Amazon. But outside of that, I, uh, it's really hard to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Jeff, getting back to uh, your current company, Arcturus and uh, Industries, uh, with Occipital Experience, what is your strategy to compete with these big um, giant companies? Because uh, the core technologies you mentioned, um, they are also working on those. Yes. Um, We are trying to be this platform independent option and and to power the others in the space and so i i at least as of now it's it's we're not competing directly we're not trying to um you know displace what they're doing directly we're trying to provide an alternative for for everyone else and um and so that is that is our approach it's kind of, you know, it's a relatively common approach. Like when there's a, when there are incumbents that are generally closed and, you know, walled gardens in a market, one of the approaches can be to be more open and to be more independent, platform independent and things like that. Um, in some sense, the way that the Google initially approached uh, Android is that it was sort of the open alternative for all the other players. And so, and so I think that's kind of some of the spirit of, of what we're doing. And I think um, I mentioned we're partnered with Valve on yeah. some of that work. And I think they have a lot of the same spirit. If you look at what they did with uh, with Steam and you know with Steam VR and the Lighthouse system, people were able to build other devices, like all sorts of exciting devices powered by Lighthouse tracking. And Valve didn't keep that all for themselves. They let other people build systems on top of Lighthouse. And, um, and I, I really like that approach. I think that's really analogous to our approach is to let other people leverage this technology that are, and, and not try to keep it for ourselves. And, and so that, that's our approach. And, and the fact that we are partnered with Valve is a key part of our approach too, because they are uh, someone I think that can help legitimize with this technology. And, and maybe we'll see, I mean, I, we can't talk at all about exactly what we're doing with them, but hopefully some of the steps we take with them will allow us to get this out to the world as well. So, so yeah, and, and also working with uh, people like that can allow us to really battle hard on our technology to make sure that it's extremely good. And, and I want someone, when they use our stuff, to say, this feels better than the Quest. Huh. Yeah. Um, and, and when I try our stuff, I, I already feel that. Uh, there's still some things that, mm, that Oculus, Oculus has done an amazing job, but... I'd say when you put our stuff on and you you move around, you just it just feels a little more natural, a little more accurate, and um, and that's what we're going for. We're we're making it so there's no trade offs. Whereas today, you know, if you try to use some open source stuff or uh, built in stuff, it's it just doesn't. It's not as good of an experience, and and we want to make sure this is best in class. Mm-hmm. Great, can't wait to try that. Um, so, Jeff, as of our last question, how do you envision the future of AR and VR in a decade, in a half a century or so? That's that's a great question. In a decade and a half century, so I'll, I'll maybe answer that, and, and I'll answer both of those maybe. Uh-huh. So, in a decade, I I see I see us having AR VR devices laying around the home. I don't necessarily see us wearing 
AR all the time in a decade, but I see it being very accessible within reach. We will pick up a VR or AR device for a video chat. Uh, we'll wear it around the house a lot of the time. We'll, we'll use it to capture memories in a better way than today. If we have, you know, I have an 18 month old daughter and I miss so many mm -hmm. of her first moments because I don't like have my phone on. And I'm sure you've experienced this. You like try to turn on the phone camera and of the course, right. The gone. moment where you want it. Yeah, the moment is gone or, or that's the exact moment where your phone camera decides to freeze. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, I think, I think the device, I think AR and VR is going to, is going to play a huge role in, in, in play in ways like that in 10 years. I, so many of us are going to, it's just going to be this appliance that we pick up and they're going to be naturally multi-user. You're going to, you, if, if three of three or four people put them on, they're all going to be in the same shared space and they can share the same experience which is something that just frustratingly you kind of can't do very easily now if yeah if we have two quests and we put them on in the same room they don't do the same thing they don't share the same space which is i think just a, a missed a huge missed opportunity that's going to be one of these mind-blowing next-gen experiences when somebody actually does that right and we can put things on and it's like we can both be in the same experience at the same time with doing zero setup that's that's going to happen. So ten years from now, we're going to have, you know, devices with. By the way, know, Jeff, uh, we've done something yeah. about that in Alpha Reality. <laughs> exactly that. Good, <laughs> good. Make it happen because yeah. I, I want that. I want that around my house. I I want I want lighter weight, you know, devices that will remove the necessity to to have like, you know, TVs in the walls. And I think that's what's going to happen in ten years. I think mm -hmm. in fifty years. Um, we are going to have solved the crazy hard display technology problems and even things with contact lenses and things like that. I don't know that contact lenses are going to be able to like completely adjust our, our view of everything, but we're certainly going to be able to have small displays and things like that. So, and, and I actually wonder if contacts are actually the future more so than even glasses. Um, uh, but we probably will have some, you know, thing we wear around our neck or something like that that serves for power and and compute, and then and then we'll have uh, we'll have these displays, and um, I don't know, we'll probably have some biosynthesis stuff going on where we actually get little implanted cameras and things like that. Fifty years out, um, but but AR uh, fifty years out, I think will actually truly have replaced the phone. We won't have the smartphone, I think, anymore at that time. But I think we will have, I think we will have displays that are. So I think our primary person-based compute will be moved to an AR system within 50 years. Mm -hmm. But then I think we'll have a set of displays sitting around, and you can just pick any one of them up, and and your AR system can display onto those those displays, which can also provide a tactile input. Because one thing we just have to remember is like we have fingers, we have tactile senses, and unless we're talking full neural implants, which is an area I don't know that much about and sounds a little scary to me, <laughs> we're not gonna we're gonna need tactile things. And a real benefit of a phone is tactile. You can touch it, you can do yeah. multi-touch, you can you get you get tactile feedback and you don't get that from AR. So so I think we're gonna have tactile screens that we can pick up and 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 our our wearable systems can beam to those systems. Uh, we're going to have, I think, maybe a, a cultural shift that could happen. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite side effects of, of AR, and this is scary and exciting at the same time, is that right now, when you, you know, walk down a street, you, you just, you kind of, you, you, uh, you profile people. Somebody looks scary. They look like they're homeless. Maybe they're going to come after me. Like, you know, you kind of end up doing all this profiling based on just appearance and we know that's not a good thing but we do it but with an ar system that's you know it, it'll tell you that homeless guy actually wrote a best-selling novel right yeah and like yeah, he yeah, knows your be. your cousin right and and but maybe this will be positive right if this is done right it can be a it can be a force for good and um and and it won't matter what people look like anymore it'll just matter like who they are and so but then we get into very big challenges of how uh, how we curate this information and what what is shown to you and what isn't and um, and I think another thing that goes along with AR is and maybe even more important than AR displays and things is the concept of a personal intelligent agent 
that operates on your behalf, not on Google's behalf or Amazon's behalf or, you know, like we have today or even Apple's behalf, but on your behalf actually, and is, is searching information that might be relevant to you and bringing that information to you and is trainable and tunable for you and is something that you will pay for. I think you'll actually pay for these agents and you'll pay for different ones. Um, but, but in the future, I think that's going to be a necessity because the world just keeps getting more complex. And in order to maintain that, you know, to, to beat down that complexity, we're going to need uh, intelligent agents that can act on our behalf. And those, I think, are going to be fused somewhat with our, with our AR systems. It's, it's kind of like the movie Her, in a way, huh, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, hopefully a better version of that. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and fully independent and, and for you and, and something that I deeply hope people pay for, not something that we get for free because we get ads or exactly. we get a biased view on the world. But I, that's, that's my 50 year vision for AR is that it's, it's, it's probably migrated to contacts. It's, there are, there are slates that are around us that we pick up for, for tactile. There are agents that are making a doing a lot of information filtering and even some decision making for us like hey show me the apartments around here that would be interesting oh okay yeah please uh generate a contract for that one for me um tell me you know what what do i need to answer like you know can you find some find a place for us to go for dinner tonight okay show me what that looks like okay like that's the kind of the way that i think we'll interact with computing and and, and it's a necessity because if we especially if we give up some of our day-to-day -day tactile interfaces where we can touch and type and do all these things. And we're going to go to like voice and visual interfaces. We need systems that are making a lot of the decisions for us, uh, but ones that we can trust. And so that's, that's the scary part. If I were <laughs> wanting to AR for, for 50 years out, I would, I would start working on how do I, how do we build AI agents that actually act on our behalf in, in a good way? And we need to solve that or we'll never have these systems I think, you know, uh, well, the systems will do more harm than good. So mm -hmm. that's the future we see. Um, but, uh, and, and even when that future comes, I think we'll still, uh, I don't know, maybe we're still going to have laptops <laughs> and keyboards and this stuff just yeah, may maybe. live way longer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great. Um, well, Jeff, um, thanks very much for joining the All Things XR podcast. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.